So first of all, uh, I apologize for the English. I can probably do this in Hungarian, but uh, I'm too embarrassed to make as many mistakes as I would inevitably make. So I'll just make the mistakes in English. Uh, can you hear me? Do you want a uh, microphone? If you don't, you don't need a microphone. Okay, cool. Because otherwise, I would have to have something in both hands, which is really annoying. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what it means to start a startup, and how do you finance it, and how do you value it, and uh, where do you get the money. This is what I do every day, and this is the kind of explanations that I have to give to my clients every day, and there are a lot of subtleties, and I can go into as much subtlety as you like. I spend the morning trying to educate a uh, a, a journalist from Barron's magazine today on what happened to Square. I think you know that Square just went public and it went public at a price that was below the expected price and the last financing round that they did was had something called a ratchet which meant that if the uh, public offering was at a price that was below the amount per share that the financing was made at plus a return of 20 percent a year uh, which, was, which happened to be the case, they got a whole bunch of extra shares so that effectively they paid, uh, they got as many shares so that if they, the company went public, they would be able to make uh, whatever their investment was plus 20%. And that he wanted to understand what that meant because when, when that happens, everybody else who owns stock in the company owns a smaller percentage of the stock and what does that mean and how is that impacted. <coughs> Very complicated, a whole bunch of very subtle issues. Uh, I looked at half a dozen articles that covered this issue in the last two days. Not a single one of them knew what they were talking about. Hopefully this guy at Barron's got enough of an education so he now understands how this all works. But, you know, there's a lot of subtleties and it's actually very, very interesting. Just to give you one more piece of information on the Barron's piece, uh, it's so complicated that I was just involved in a very similar situation where there were two other law firms that were involved in the financing and they proposed, they were explaining to the board of directors of a company what the impact of this financing is going to be on all the other shareholders. Both of them were totally wrong. Both of them said that at the end of the day after this financing, the founders will still own 20% of the company. In fact, when you run the numbers, the founders own 0.5, 5 tenths of 1% of the company. And that's because the lawyers did not understand either Excel or the concept of simultaneous equations. Because every time that you do a dilution in each class of preferred stock, it ripples back and around in a circle until the only people who end up screwed are the founders. And that's what happened in this particular case. So, with that exciting and, and enthusiastic uh, uh, comment about uh, financing, let's talk about what, what it means to start a company. And this is what it means. You start with an idea. Somebody comes up with an idea. I'm going to uh, challenge uh, the hotel industry by convincing people to rent their apartment and uh, get paid for it. Proof of concept. I convince all of my friends in Cambridge to rent their apartment and have this little uh, website that uh, coordinates people who want to rent their apartment for a day or two days or, or a week with people who are looking for a place to stay when they come to Cambridge. Prototype. Not only I convince my friends to do that, but I actually build a website on which all of this stuff can be done like in a marketplace like eBay. First commercial use. I start charging for this idea first commercial use. And people actually pay first commercial use. Small scale commercial adoption. A ton of people in Cambridge start using this stuff and eventually I can get Boston people to also rent their apartment. It becomes a first commercial use and then market growth. So these are sort of the beginning steps of starting a company. Pretty obvious. So then the question is how do you get these things financed? Well, with the idea it's Whoever kind of came up with the idea, that's what's called sweat equity. You work like crazy to come up with the idea. You start the company. You didn't put a dime into it other than 
for late night pizza and beer, and that's your sweat equity. And once you got there, and you have to get a proof of concept, you're going to have to hire some people to do some software developing. You have to get some ads in the paper. You have to get ads in, in the paper anymore. You have to get ads in uh, Facebook or whatever. So you need a little bit of money, say, anywhere from ten to a hundred thousand dollars. And what you do is you go to your dad, you go to your college roommate, and say, hey, I, would you give me some money? I have this fabulous idea. And if they think it's a good idea, and if they trust you to try to execute this, they'll give you this money. And we'll talk about how they're going to give it to you. But let's just assume for the moment that you get $50,000 from your friends. That's your friends and family finance. You then show proof of concept. This thing really works. People are actually willing to spend money and actually willing to believe that this idea works. And you take that proof of concept, which is called the alpha, and you go to a bunch of angels. Who are these angels? These angels are people who have made money in the past and who have done it on the same basis pretty much as, as, as you are proposing to do. Entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs who sold their company or are making a ton of money on their company. And it depends, who are these angels depends on what your product is. I was talking yesterday to a uh, uh, a client of mine who raised $35 million, $35 million from angels. And he raised it from, I think, 10 or 12 angels. So people wrote checks from a $500,000 minimum to $4 million. Angel people, angel financing people. And they loved this idea because it involved a particular disease curing this particular disease. And every single person who wrote that check had a relative who was suffering from or was about to die from that <coughs> disease. And they saw this as a way to solve this particular problem, not necessarily for their relatives, but for the world. And because they saw that there are a lot of people suffering from this, they saw the commercial opportunity in this particular invention. The same thing if it's, a, if it's a piece of IT, if it's a piece of software, if it's a piece of hardware. People who are angels don't only give money because they want to make a return, they want to make more money. They do it because they're excited about the idea. They buy into the idea. And that's the difference necessarily between an angel and a VC, a venture capitalist. An angel typically invests because they want to see the uh, they want to get, you know, a lot of them, it started out uh, a number of years ago when I first met these angels and I always asked, why, why are you investing in these companies? And it's because they say, we want to, we, we are in the same industry, we, we, we want to continue to see how the industry grows, we want to be able to participate sort of vicariously in the next phase of the industry, or we are somehow otherwise passionate about this particular product. First commercial use, you, you've, you've spent your money, and then the next step, typically. And this is not always the case, that my, my friend who raised $35 million, well, that's still going to be a prototype, because in life sciences, that's not a lot of money. But in a technology company, that will take you all the way to a public offering. In any event, first commercial use, typically, that's when you get your Series A financing from a venture capitalist. Now, you ask, who are venture capitalists? And I don't know if I had done this before, but I'm going to do it now. How many of you are putting money away for retirement? Just raise your hand. Where do, you, where do you put that money? I assume you put it in some sort of a pension fund, right? Uh, you give it to Fidelity. Well, what do you think Fidelity does with that money? Fidelity takes that money and tries to find a marker that works. Fidelity takes that money, that's Fidelity, and for every $100 that it gets, it takes between two and three dollars and invests it in what's called alternative investments. So ninety-seven dollars goes into stocks and bonds in the stock market and in bonds. Two to three and, 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 and gets a return that's pretty puny, you know, whatever is your typical return in the stock market and whatever your zero return right now in the bond market. But two, three dollars of every hundred dollars they go crazy with. And they invested with the expectation 
that since all of us are expected to live a lot longer than before, they're going to have to take all the money that you're putting into these funds, and they're going to have to produce an extraordinary amount of return to pay for your retirement. And these two, two to three dollars, about every hundred, is what they put in alternative investments. And that is typically venture capital and private equity. Because they expect venture capital and private equity to produce returns in the 10 to 20 to 30 percent a year range. Whether that happens or not, who knows? Certainly in private equity it happens, and in a lot of successful venture funds it happens. So these guys put the money into a bunch of venture funds. And these venture funds invest in a whole bunch of companies. And that's where you get your Series A. <coughs> now, keep in mind, and I'll come back to this, but keep in mind that when they invest your money in these companies, they know that out of every 10 companies, and I can only write five here, there's not enough space, that they invest in, three or four will go bankrupt. One or two will just chug along. And they may have one out of every 10 investments that's going to be the next Facebook of the world. And that one investment has to pay for all of this and produce a 20 to 30 percent return. 20 to 30 percent per year. So they got to win. They got to be able to make 10, 20 times their money on this one investment because all the other ones are basically junk. So the other thing you've got to keep in mind is that they're not putting money into this company, into your companies, because they want to earn a dividend, because they want to take the profits of the company and pay that back to the, uh, to the pension fund, to Fidelity. They put money into this fund. They have, this fund has a life of 10 years. That's typical. And they put money into this fund so that within 10 years, this money could be invested for the first five years, typically. And the ne next five, five years, they have to harvest, meaning that somehow they have to take this, these investments and turn it into cash. That's the exit. That's the harvesting of the investment. So you have to know that when you invest, when you get money from a venture fund, if it's a, if it's a young fund that just started, you might have nine years until you, uh, until you have to somehow give this money back with that huge return to the venture fund and ultimately to the pension fund. If the fund has been in existence for five years, you only have five more years. Interesting question to ask, yeah? Can they sell their sh share to another fund? Sure, and that happens too. But they're not going to be your partners for very long. They need an exit. The exit can be an IPO, an initial public offering, it can be a sale. They can sell it to another fund. They can sell it to what's called a strategic investor, which is typically a company, a corporation like GE or whatever happens to be the corporation that's interested in this technology. Or you can go and find another fund, another fund, another VC fund, and you can get their money and use that money to pay them out and keep them going. So there are different ways of exiting. And what's really uh, relevant about this is that at the end of the day, you just have to know that this marriage that you're entering into is a 10-year marriage at most. So you would love the people in the fund. They're only going to be around for, at most, 10 years. And then you're going to have to divorce them and find somebody else. Just important to remember. And the reason is because they got to pay you the Retirement. By the time that this money is harvested, you're going to be retired, and they're going to pay you retirement. What is the return that they expect over those ten years? So, in the at the time that they need, they they expect on the average a twenty to thirty percent annual compound rate of return. That's on the average. So they need one Facebook, which has a hundred fifty two hundred percent compound rate of return in order to wipe out the companies, in order to balance out the companies that are wiped out. This is why they are so, this is why you call them vulture capitalists, right? 
<laughs> if they are only looking... uh, part of the equity, say 25% of the equity of the company. What's that? If they only own 25%. They own whatever. They own whatever. I'll come up, come to that in a minute. But they own they own whatever they think is going to get them that return. So, let's come back to this little uh, little chart. You don't only get money from investors. And keep in mind, there is the Series A investor, and then you go back, and after you get the first commercial use, every time that you get to what's called the value inflection point, every time that you get to a point where you've proven that something is gonna, has gotten to the next step, first commercial use, you've done small-scale small commercial adoption, you've sold to the US, you're so selling in Europe, you're selling in Asia, every time that there's an inflection point, uh, think about uh, uh, Square. I don't know if you, do you know what Square is? Yes. So Square is this little white tab that you attach to your phone. And then if you're a small merchant and you wanna buy it at a fair uh, anything, you give them the credit card, you swipe it on the Square, and it's, it's charged. Turns your, your, your phone into a, uh, into a cash, cash register. That's what Square is. Yes. So think about what happened to Square. Do you re pull out your credit card. What do you see on the credit card that wasn't there a year ago? A little chip. So Square started with the, with the magnetic stripe. Guess what? They now have to totally change their model because now it's required by law that every credit card has a chip. Think about the cost of putting, the, putting that into this little white box this little white thing that they have. That's why they needed five series of financings. They went from series A, series B1, B2, 3, 4, 5. So they had all the way up, and you can go from B to triple W, whatever. There are companies that have eight, 10 series of financings. And then, finally, there's an exit. In the meantime, a lot of companies, especially in life science and in various types of technology, like uh, cyber security, they try to get what's called non-dilutive financing, which means financing that's not in stock, it's just money either as a price or as a loan. Government grants, like SBIs, SBI, SBIs. Joint ventures, they go to, uh, uh, Square went to uh, uh, Starbucks and got a bunch of money from Starbucks to uh, continue to develop his product. Venture debt. So if, as you asked, what, what do the venture capitalists want as a return on their investment, and I said 20 to 30% a year, venture debt is like a bank, except it's not, uh, in the following way. They lend you money. You have to return the money, but then they take a small piece of equity in a warrant or an option. <clears throat> so let's say that you, you borrow the money and they charge 8% interest. Then you get a warrant, which if things work out well, you give them a warrant, you get a, they, they can turn that into stock and make another 5%, 6%. So instead of having to give away all this stock for a 20 to 30% annual return, you borrow the money and you give them a little bit of stock. That's called an equity kicker. So that's a better, better deal. It's not as dilutive. It doesn't <coughs> make the percentage owned by the investors as small as it would otherwise. And then commercial loans and so forth. So this is the... So let's talk about value. It's my favorite, my favorite part of the program because, because it's, it's something that has to do with a pizza. <laughs> Just think of this as a pizza. When you start a company, let's say you have three founders, and let's say you decide that each of you is bringing the same value to the company. Not always the case, but let's assume that's the case for the moment. So here you have a little pizza with three founders, each owning one slice of the pizza. That's the sweat equity. Now you bring in your friends and family. So what do you give them? You could give them stock. And in this particular case, that's what I did. You give them common stock. And let's say that they own somewhere around 26, 27% of the company for $400,000 or whatever the number is. The pizza is bigger because the company is grown the value has grown. Uh, each of the founders 
owns the same percentage as against the other founders, they have a smaller percentage of a bigger part. <coughs> Notice that this slice is a bigger slice than that slice. You can eat more pizza even though you own a smaller percentage of the company. Important to remember. Then you bring in the angel investor. Angel comes in and says, I want 20% of the company. The company is bigger. You put in the money because you, help, you want the company to continue to grow. So the angel ends up with 25% of the company. It reduces everybody else's interest. But still, every slice is bigger than it was way back here. And that's what you're trying to do. And then you could have a venture capital financing and look at this, this becomes very complicated. Here are the founders, A and B. Founder C decided to go to Hawaii and get married to a mermaid. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, you hired a good lawyer who said, all of you guys should protect against each other by signing an, a prenuptial agreement called a shareholders agreement. It's just like what you like to do before you get married. And the prenuptial agreement said, that we expect each of these founders to work for the company for four years. This guy went to Hawaii after one year and married a mermaid. He lost three quarters of the stock that he got because of the stock restriction agreement or shareholder agreement because he only put in one fourth of the value that was expected when he got all of his shares. So suddenly, these two founders have the original share Notice how much bigger the, the pie is. This guy has a little piece, because he did contribute, but after a year, no more. Here are the friends and family. Here's the angel. Here are the Series A investors who got somewhere around 27, 28% of the stock. And in the meantime, you created something called a management equity pool, which is a bunch of stock that you set aside so that as you hire more people, that you can't pay the same amount that they would get if they work for General Electric. But what you tell them is you'll get 50% of what you would get at General Electric, but at the same time you'll get a bunch of stock, and if this stock ends up being Square or Facebook, the upside is 10 times as much as you would ever get at General Electric. Because General Electric stock, if you get some of that, appreciates relatively slowly, but this company is going to be the next unicorn, you know what a unicorn is, right? The company that's incredibly successful. And then uh, you ask the question about what happens if the venture cap, as, as, you, as you get bigger, uh, what happens is something that's like venture capital is private equity. And the difference between venture capital and private equity is just that private equity typically is invest in later stage companies. It's, it's less risky. The return that the investors expect is not 20 to 30 percent, maybe it's 15 to 25 percent, because it's less risky, it's later in the stage. But, um, so that's the series B or series C, whole bunch of different, whole bunch of different kinds of securities that are in here, including warrants, which are what you give to a, a bank, which is like an option where if, if the uh, stock is worth a lot of money, they exercise it and they make the difference between the exercise price and the value of the stock. So this is what this looks like. And then, uh, if you do an IPO, all of these guys get <laughs> shrunk, and the invest this is the investors, this is friends and family, management founders, and the public ends up owning a percentage of the stock. So this is, an, this is how valuation, this is how value grows, and I always say, that it's better to have a, a smaller percentage of a bigger pizza than a bigger percentage. Where was this? Of this little tiny pizza. Okay, everybody talks about valuation, pre money valuation, post money valuation. Big deal. It's actually very, very simple. Pre-money valuation, what does that mean? It means that if you go to your friends and family <coughs> and you tell them that you want, uh, let's run the math here, you want to raise $2 million from them. Sorry, the friends and family put money in there already. 
uh, and you, you say, you go to a venture capitalist and you say, we want a certain amount of money from you and we think the pre-money valuation, the, mon the company is worth before any money comes in, $8 million. How do you know it's worth $8 million? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> this stuff is made up every day. Uh, there are, I can tell you because my son goes to uh, business school and I actually know this stuff even before he went to business school, there are different valuation methodologies from a comparable to a liquidation to a book value to a discounted cash flow value. And there are all these analysts and all these venture capital funds who come up with these valuations because they have to do something. But those valuations just justify whatever the big cheese says he wants to put in or she wants to put into the company and they just have to be rationalized. There's no real way to do it. But we're going to say it's an $8 million pre-money valuation. So then what happens is the VC investors put in $6 million. Six and eight is 14. That's your post-money valuation. And if you, so the investor said, okay, we buy into the fact that your company is worth $8 million before we put a dime in. We, you need six million dollars because that's what your business plan says. So we'll give you six million dollars and for six million dollars we want six fourteenth of the company. That's your post money valuation. Very simple. This part is actually relatively simple. By the way, nobody really cares about pre-money valuation. Everybody talks about it, but it really is totally relevant. What's really important is post money valuation. What percentage well, how much is the company worth based on what the investors are willing to pay? So we're coming back to the uh, square example, and you should read this because it's actually very cool, at least for me who is a lawyer and is a kind of a geek when it comes to this stuff. But the investors in square, the last set of investors, this is like series F, had an interesting debate with the founders. <clears throat> the founders said that the pre-money valuation of square was whatever. A billion. And the investor said, no, no, we think the pre-money valuation of Square is a half a billion. So that was a little bit of an impasse. So then the, then the company said, I'll tell you what, if you're right and we go public and the valuation of Square is only a half a billion, we'll double the number of shares that you get. That's what's called the ratchet. You will, at the IPO, if, you, if we don't go public at $15 a share, which is $12 that you originally put in, plus a 20% return, we'll give you additional shares so that you end up at what you thought was the value. That's what they did. And in fact, they got a ton of additional shares because uh, Square was supposed to come out at 15 and came out at 9. Of course, what that meant is that for the given amount of money they put in, they got a bigger slice of the company, a bigger slice of the pizza. Of course, everybody else's slice shrunk. Guess whose sh uh, uh, slice shrunk the most? The founders, by $84 million. They still did very well. If you read the article in Fortune, it shows you exactly how well they did. The initial investors made zillions of dollars, but it was zillion minus 60, uh, 86 million. So, uh, I got to come back to this pizza because there is another piece to it that's really important. I was explaining this whole thing to a bunch of people at Mass Challenge. And I was explaining to them this whole principle of smaller percentage of a bigger pizza is a good thing. And they said, okay, but like, it's not just about the money. It, the whole thing is about control. If these guys get more shares, they're going to own a majority of the stock and they're going to be able to control the company. So I said to them, you are totally wrong. There is no relationship between percentage ownership and control. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. Why is that? Because you're assuming that you, uh, uh, corporations run like the United States government, where you vote, everybody has one vote, 
and whoever has a majority wins. Let's go back to square. They have two kinds of shares. They have regular shares, series A and series B, common shares. Guess what? What the public buys is series B shares. And guess how many votes they have per share? One. How many votes does the, do the shares have the series A shares that the founders and the investors got, have, got way back? 10. 10 votes for every share. So even though they own a small percentage or relatively small percentage of the company, they control everything. They have 92.8% of the voting rights in the shares. Easy enough. By the way, it's all kinds of articles say how terrible it is. There's a whole institutional investor control board that says this is a really bad thing to do. And Facebook has it. You know, uh, Square has it. All the unicorn companies have this special voting. There's another aspect, too. The venture capitalists, not only uh, they may own a minority of the company, but they have a set of special rights that are built into the preferred stock that they get. Because they get preferred stock, you get common stock. The preferred stock has what's called veto rights or control rights. You want to hire a new CEO. You want to get a bank loan. You want to issue additional stock. You want to merge or, 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 or do an acquisition. You have to get the approval of the preferred stock. And there's one more thing you should know, which is that the preferred stock, if this company is sold, the investors have this kind of, you got it, oh, I forgot the expression, but you have it this way, you got it, you have it that way, you got it, you'll see what I mean. If the company is sold for an amount of money that is a relatively low amount, say that there is four, six million dollars put in here and there is eight million dollars, six million dollars put in here and the company is sold for eight million dollars. The first six million dollars plus an interest factor of say six to eight percent is given to the preferred shareholders. So they may only own 45% of the company, but if you sell for uh, $6 million or anything you know, low, they get whatever they are entitled to, and then whatever is left, the dregs, those are given to the, to the rest of the shareholders. If you sell the company for $100 million, they can convert their preferred to common and then they get 45% of the $100 million. So one way or the other, they win. They win on the equity, and they win on the control. And I was telling this story, and I was telling this story to the guys at Mass Challenge, and I was explaining to them this thing, and I, had, I was talking alongside the venture capitalist, the very well-known venture capitalist, and he says, you know, we don't like to control the company. The company has to be controlled by the managers, because if we, that's why we invest in managers, we invest in people we believe in, I said, well, then why do you have all these control provisions? And he said, well, because we just want to make sure that if there's a big issue, they'll talk to us. They'll come to talk to us so that we are partners. That they'll, 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 they'll discuss with them and we'll reach a consensus. And I said, you know, that reminds me of my family, you know. I sit around at the pizza parlor discussing what kind of pizza we're going to get. And I'm the one who writes the checks. Or, or, or pays the credit card to the, to the guy at Square. Uh, in any event, and, and, I, and, and we all have to discuss and get consensus on what pizza we're going to order. And the only problem is I never get the anchovy pizza that I would like. <laughs> so I told this story and everybody thought it was funny. At the end of the uh, presentation, uh, somebody comes up to me from Mass Challenge, one of their staff, and delivers a small anchovy pizza. <laughs> so the first time I had an anchovy pizza in a very long time, in any event. So, uh, so that's kind of the picture side of what, what's going on. Uh, this is more words, and I'll just kind of go through this very quickly. Uh, what are the law, legal requirements for going to these different <laughs> kinds of investors? Friends and family, you don't have to tell them almost anything. Uh, you, uh, you raise small amounts of money, you can only go to as few number of people. Uh, the motivation is they have ties to you. Uh, there is now something called 
the Jobs Act where there's crowdfunding, which gets to be an interesting thing. I can talk about that later, but that's sort of the new way to get small amounts of money. It's sort of the uh, Kickstarter of stock, if you're familiar with that. And there are a whole bunch of ways that you can get money now from uh, people, uh, small amounts of money from, from people uh, for companies that are not registered on the stock market. I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, just like I think it's a terrible idea, you know, we're very close to Thanksgiving, and I can tell you that uh, I'm having Thanksgiving with uh, uh, a bunch of people, including a very close friend of mine who just, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur, who uh, uh, just, his, his fourth company just went bankrupt. Uh, at most, he's going to make, he's going to be able to sell the intellectual property for maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars, and. It's going to be a little awkward because I'm friends and family to this company, and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, he's lost some of my money. Now he made money. In, I made money with him on the prior deals, but friends and family is what you think it is. You know, try to explain to them at Thanksgiving dinner why you lost all of you, all of the money they gave you. Now, how do you finance if you're a friend and family? What what do you invest in? You don't invest typically in stock. Because how the hell do you know what the company is worth at that very, very early stage? I mean, the venture capitalists pretend to know because they have a bunch of analysts who retrospectively justify whatever the cost, whatever the value is that they invent. But you don't even have a bunch of analysts in your back pocket. So what you do is you get a convertible note. And what that is is an instrument that's basically like a note that you issue to a bank when you get a mortgage or buy a car. And, but what it does is it's kind of like the preferred stock I talked to you before. It's convertible into stock. And what you're doing is punting the value. What you're saying is, I'm giving you $100,000. I'm getting a $100,000 note. And when you do a venture financing, where those experts are going to give an expert opinion on value, if they pay a dollar a share, so they think the value is a dollar a share, I can buy that, I can take my $100,000 note and get $120,000 worth of shares. Because I invested early, I get a discount. So I buy the same shares they have, I piggyback on their valuation, but I get a discount because I was in there early, I took a greater risk. So that's the convertible note. Investor rights, those are the veto powers that I talked about before. They typically have little investor, little investor rights because they're friends and family. They're not entitled to anything except to ask you at Thanksgiving what the hell you did with my money. Uh, angels are the next stage. Those are professionals. And they typically also get a convertible notes. And uh, they are typically serial entrepreneurs, successful business people. There are some angel funds. I'm actually a member of it. And the motivation they have is vicarious participation in the enterprise. They want to feel like they're part of a team. And they, they typically understand the industry, the space, and they do want a return on the investment. And they're a pain in the ass because typically they'll call you every day to, get, to see how your money is going, how the money that they invested is doing in the company. But they're useful. Yes? Do they have information rights? Like if you, if they typically they have information rights. Yes. Just like your friends and family. They just ask you at Thanksgiving. In the case of angel financing, they have to you have to actually sign a piece of paper that says that you're gonna send them some financial statements. So you actually have to get it. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so they get convertible notes, investor rights, board seat, more information, receive and and then when they convert into stock, they get the same rights as the venture capitalists. So not only do they get a discount. Once the value is determined by a venture capitalist, they get they basically pick it back on all the all, all, all the rights that the uh, that the venture capitalists get. And I'm not going to talk about cram downs and where they find your angels because I have no clue. Uh, actually, I do, but it's, it's too complicated and too long. Uh, so here is the venture capitalist. So we we talked a little bit about what's a venture fund, uh, where do they get their money. Uh, let me give you one more piece of information that's going to help you in understanding how a venture fund works. So let's say that a venture fund goes to Fidelity and raises $100 million. 
out of that $100 million, the people who manage that money and invest it in these companies, they have to live, they have to pay their mortgage. But they don't make a lot of money. So what they get is a management fee. They create, the venture fund is an entity that has all the money, and it contracts with a bunch of people called the managers, and those are the fund managers, those are the people who invest the money. And they get a management fee that's typically 2% of the money that's invested per year. So for $100 million, they get $2 million a year. And that's their, that's going to pay for the rent and the secretaries and, 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 and their mortgage. Then they also get some, and, and this is ordinary income, this is compensation. This is this, to the extent that the managers actually get salary, they pay ordinary income tax. Okay? That's going to become relevant in the next comment. Then they get something called carry interest. probably read about is in the newspaper and if you don't know what it means you know you're going to know it in three minutes 20 percent is your typical market rate for carried interest what's carried interest let's say that the fund invests in 10 companies takes the hundred million dollars minus the two percent so it's only like 96 or 94 million dollars two whatever however long it is invests it in a bunch of companies and then starts harvesting those companies selling them to a, another buyer, taking them public and taking the stock and, 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 and turning it into cash, whatever. Once they take all that money and return it to, the, uh, to, to Fidelity, once they, once they get $100 million returned to Fidelity, not just what they invested, the 92, but the 100, in other words, including the money they took up as, 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 as management fees. Once they get that money, everything else is profit, right? Everything else is profit. So if they make $200 million by selling all of their companies, the first $100 million is return of capital. The next $100 million is profit. They get 20% of the next $100 million. They make $20 million. Why do you think all these venture capitalists run around in fancy cars and have beautiful boats and nice houses? It's because if they're successful, they make 20% of, 20 cents of every dollar of profit that they generate for fidelity. That's a really nice deal. What makes it nicer is that for reasons that are only, I'm not gonna explain it because I, I, I won't take sides. But what makes it nicer is that 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 twenty million dollars is capital gains. It's taxable at fifteen or twenty percent instead of forty percent. So I work for my living and I pay 40, 40 cents of every dollar, forty-five cents of every dollar because it's also state taxes to the government. You only pay twenty cents of every dollar on that on that twenty million dollars. It's a nice gig if you can do it. That's where they make all their money. This is what Trump wants to do away with interest. This is what actually Obama wanted to do away with, interestingly enough. But these people so far have only shared, uh, are only two groups have, that have been able to withstand popular demand on both sides of the aisle uh, by maintaining the capital gain rate for, uh, for this moment. The other one is the uh, National Rifle Association. <laughs> Uh, in any event, <laughs> what money we're talking about nationwide? What money we're talking about nationwide? How much? How, how much money? Yeah. What's the it's quality? not going to make the difference between you know get uh, 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 you know it, it's more a sense of what's fair, right? But it's it's and, and actually, well anyhow, it's 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 a it's a debate. I mean, technically. You can argue it's capital gains because it's a long, you know, they're holding stock for a long time and then they sell it. So it's like any other stock. In any event, what do VCs provide? They say that it's not just money, but it's value added experience. They provide uh, tremendous experience, connections. They've been here, they've seen it before, they put companies together, they find employees who are experts in the field. So they say they provide a lot more than money, they have value added. 
And what is it that they have? We talked about it a little bit. They get that liquidation preference, which means if the company is sold for a small amount of money, they get paid out first. They get convertible protection, meaning that if you sell a stock later for a lower price, they get additional shares. They have these special governance rights. We talked about protective rights and exit rights. So they have all kinds of rights that they don't have. I don't know why that happened. Let's see if I can make this go back. Oh, maybe that's the last slide. Um, okay. In that case, I have nothing else to say. No, that's not true. <laughs> I always have something to say, but I am going to stop here and ask you uh, what questions you got. Square esetére, visszatérve, miért jött be az eredeti ár alatt? Azért, mert a nagy bankok, akik jegyzik, azok nem értékelték annyira, mint amire ők szerették volna. Hát, az volt a kérdés, hogy miért jött a Square, mikor a tőzsdébe jött, miért jött a sokkal a, a, a olcsóbbá, mint az eredeti a, a, a kérdés volt. Mert azt mondták eredetileg, hogy 13-14 dollár, vagy 15 dollár ér egy, 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 egy részvény, és bejött 9 dollár. Ez miért? Először is azt is kell tudni, hogy a második nap most már az 13-14 dollárral you know, they're trading at $13, $14 a share. So uh, maybe they left about $100 million on the table. But typically what happens is that when a company goes public, <clears throat> the underwriters purposely price the initial price at below what they think it's worth so that, this com so that the stock pops, meaning it goes up in value after the initial public offering it creates a sense of excitement. It's also, it, among us, a little <coughs> reward for people who get to buy in the initial public offer. So those people are also these same guys, Fidelity, who when, when you first go around and try to price a public offering, the underwriters go around to all the pension funds and they sign up, they, 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 they commit to a certain percentage of the stock at a certain price, and then everybody knows that after the IPO, the stock is hopefully going to go up, typically it does, and then they, then they can sell right away, and they make a bunch of money. So that's, that's one reason. But they made a mistake. I think it, should have, it was too big of a difference between the initial public offering price and the price at which the stock is trading now. They made a mistake. They left too much money on the table. The other thing that you have to remember about this whole uh, thing that you get extra stock when you were the last one to finance this, this is where it becomes really interesting. The reason that companies want the last round of financing to be at a very high price, and then are willing to even give these people a protection that if it doesn't get to that price, they get extra shares. The reason they do this is not because they believe the company is worth as, as much necessarily. They do it because they want to create a buzz because then you read in the Wall Street Journal, Square just did a, another round of venture financing for $5 billion. And then everybody lines up when the stock goes public. That's the theory. And figure, well, if the last round of private financing goes for $5 billion, then the company can go public at $10 billion because it's worth more because a bunch of professional investors value the company at five billion dollars. What they don't read is the fine print that if it doesn't go out for that much, those professional investors get extra stock. It, this becomes a very complicated set of marketing <coughs> ideas. It's, it's like, a, like a cycle. Yes, other questions? Uh, would you mind commenting on, you were talking about the managers for venture capital funds. Yes. Do they, how do they value these companies? Is it similar than how a fund manager would do it for a retail uh, fund? or? Yes. You is mean when they're private? Yes. Yes, they, they have to come up with a valuation methodology. They do a bunch of, you know, 
mumbo jumbo, you know, they figure out the discounted cash flow, and they have to value it every year, and they provide the report to the uh, to their limited partners, to their investors, as to what the portfolio value is. So yes, that's how they value. So I don't think but, that's what but, I was but asking. But they asking how do they pick the companies that they buy into the fund? How do they pick the companies? Yes, is there any type of different, you know, like a, let's say a large cap U.S. fund? There's a manager who's there and, and picks, uh, picks certain. Uh, well, it's the same companies. way. They have. They have. Uh, they typically there are different different uh, funds that are that do it differently. If you're uh, if you're uh, uh, a, a venture, there are venture funds that only invest in life science companies. Okay. There are venture funds that only invest in IT. They have people typically who are experts in a particular industry who study the industry and when and they evaluate companies that come in front of them from that industry to make decisions as to which one is likely to be successful. So. Uh, they get all kinds of referrals, and they also go out and hunt for good companies. And based on their own expertise, and and you know, if you if you have five partners, somebody could be an expert in cybersecurity, somebody could be an expert in uh, consumer, somebody could be an expert in uh, whatever. And these different experts will pick the companies that they think are the right companies in the sector. I personally am cynical. I think they're a bunch of lemmings. And uh, they basically get excited about a particular industry. Right now, it's cybersecurity, and then they overinvest in a particular sector. You know, it used to be energy. Now it's cybersecurity. If you're an energy company, nobody will even talk to you. Uh, <clears throat> but there's a you know there's there are, there are funds that only invest in life sciences. Third Rock is a fabulous fund. They everybody in that fund, all the founders of the fund are medical doctors, PhDs, and have Harvard Business degrees. Every single one. And they're really, really smart. And they not only pick the right companies, but then they go in there and they understand the industry. They're not just PhDs in, 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 medical, in a medical field. They're neuroscientists and they invest in a neuroscience fund. Or the other one of them is in cancer. They only, that person only looks at cancer companies. So they really understand the sectors. And not only do they pick hope to pick the right companies, but they also uh, sit on the board and help those companies by giving them advice and putting them in touch with other people in the industry and picking people out of academia and so forth. So it's a very, if you look at what's happening at MIT and Harvard, there are two or three venture funds that, as I call it, troll the halls of Harvard. So Bob Langer, I don't know how many of you know Bob Langer, Bob Langer uh, has Polaris attached at the hips. The guy who started Polaris Fund is literally, you know, has dinner with Bob Langer every week. Because Bob Langer has come up with 12 companies that are incredibly successful. Uh, that's how it works. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you seeing more, like, just in tech, are you seeing more of a role of angels? And, and that's sort of like, you know, people kind of in the valley, there's all these super angels, and angels are doing more because VCs are not adding that much value. Are you seeing that here? Uh, I, I mean, I would say that Boston is a little more conservative than California, and Boston has less money than California. So angels put in smaller amounts of money than in California. But that's not to say that there isn't a lot of money here. Uh, in life sciences, there is an enormous amount of money here, including angel money, because there are a lot of people who made a lot of money. You know, Josh Boger, who started Vertex, or Henry Termeer, who started uh, uh, Genzyme. I mean, those people invest in all kinds of companies. They have all kinds of monies, and they're super angels. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of people investing in uh, business to uh, consumer type companies, B2C companies, because People who uh, people who are in this part of the world don't, are not they don't know that field very much because they don't have they, they didn't come from those kinds of companies. Uh, in California, there's a lot more of that, but I think there's plenty of money here, and I think people are a little more conservative. But at the end of the day, uh, if you have a really good idea and a really good management team, you'll uh, you'll you'll do well. 
Somebody, uh, yeah, go ahead. So I was just curious, uh, you said the pre-man evaluation is not that important, but it seems like it kind of sets the ratio. So in that case, what if? Um, it, it's just math. It's easier to see a postman evaluation. Yeah, but let's say that Square or whoever you use in the example would only raise like two million dollars, and they would still say that they worth whatever the made up number, let's say fourteen, that it would mean that they would get twelve million from from the angels. So that would be a lot of <coughs> a proportion of the whole. Right. 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 So, I mean, how do you, what do you think is the kind of ratio that angels or, or VCs are willing to put in the company? Because it has nothing to do, it's not a ratio. Okay. Uh, you can, there are companies, I, I, I just, I have one client, I don't know why this is, but I have one client that is a really, in my mind, a great life science company that has a really great idea. Uh, amazing management team and he just got 20 million dollars in a series A financing but the investor got 75 percent of the company so that's why I think post money valuation matters 75 percent of the company for 20 million dollars that means that the company is worth whatever that is 27 million dollars uh, I have another company that uh, I to be honest, don't think is quite as exciting. Uh, and uh, uh, he had an investor put in, you know, six or seven million dollars and got 20% of the company. 80% is still with the, with the founders. Somehow, you know, people have have a sense of what valuation is. I mean, look, I I don't know if I told you this story the last time, but you know, Foley uh, has a venture fund, and before uh, my firm was Foley, we we're part of a different firm, and the little Boston office had its own little fund that everybody put in money. I made a half a million dollars. And we invested in a, many, many of our clients, like 20 of them, just putting $50,000 into each, 25 to $50,000. This was in 2019, uh, somewhere around 2000, 2003, whatever. Uh, uh, every single investment went south in 2000. Not a single investment. We, we lost all of our money. We, uh, we filed a tax return that showed that uh, we lost all of our money. And the only thing that we ever got is there was one company that had a bunch of URLs that uh, we sold uh, for a bunch of paper, a bunch of stock. And then uh, about three or four years ago, we got a call from Goldman Sachs saying, uh, what's going on? You have all this Facebook stock. Uh, the URLs were like uh, About Face, which was the name of the company that we invested in, and a whole bunch of other company names that had the word face in it that we sold to, uh, to Facebook. So we got all of our money back on that one little investment. Who the hell knew? And uh, we had to file an amended return. Uh, but that actually reminds me of something that's very important, and it's a little complicated, but Everybody says, and you know, we're Hungarian and American, and every, you know, so Hungarians always ask me, why doesn't America ever uh, subsidize? Why doesn't the government subsidize startups? You know, in, 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 in Europe, everybody, <coughs> government subsidizes startups. In the U.S., we're a, you know, we're a, a, a country, a capitalist country, uh, and uh, the government doesn't subsidize startups. Well, there's something very simple to remember. If you invest a dollar in a company, and the company takes that money and uses it for research and development, it suffers a loss, right? It, it, it takes that money and it loses it. It uses it up. There's no profit that it creates during the year that that happens. You have a choice. <coughs> that loss is actually a, an asset of the company because it can be held like a little basket until the company starts making profits. Let's say the company five years later or four years later starts making profits. The first, let's say it lost a million dollars. The first million dollars that it makes, it doesn't pay any taxes on because it can deduct from its profits the net operating loss carry forwards that it lost in prior years. 
the government just helped this company to the tune of 40% or whatever the tax rate is by not charging them taxes on that first money. That's what a C corporation does. That's what a normal corporation does. It's a little basket of goodies that it sits there. It's an asset that it can use once it makes money. Now, people ask this question all the time. What does an LL, what's an LLC? What's the difference? An LLC, a limited liability company, says, as far as the federal, the IRS is concerned, an LLC, unlike a corporation, does not exist as a separate entity. A corporation is like a human being. It pays taxes for, for purposes of the IRS. It's like a human being. It pays taxes. An LLC doesn't pay taxes. What it does is it takes the loss and it gives it to its shareholders. So that first year, if, 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 if you make a million dollars in, in, in salary, and you put a million dollars into this company as an investment, and the company loses a million dollars, I can create an LLC that takes all of that million dollars, offsets it against your income, so you don't pay any taxes. So this is really good for angels. That's why angels like LLCs. Because when they invest a dollar, the government subsidizes them to the tune of 40 cents or 45 cents. On the other hand, You've just given away a value that a C corporation would be able to keep until it's profitable. Now, when the company now now when the LLC starts earning profit, it pays taxes on the first dollar of profits. So it's a it's a closed system, right? Somebody wins, somebody loses. The difference between an LLC and a corporation is who gets the benefit of the tax losses. Now, of course, in an LLC, the first dollar that the company makes you're taxed on, again, in your income. So what's the point? The point is that you defer those taxes for three or four years until the company makes a profit. And if it never makes a profit, you've, you've had the government pay 40%. Isn't that a pretty good subsidy. governmental subsidy to startups? Yes. <coughs> I tend to disagree with what you're saying, that the government is not involved in venture capital. Because all the research which is done by the state universities and I was a graduate student at that time. They made tremendous amount of returns. The but NIH. How much money does the NIH give to biotech companies? A lot. The government is a involved lot. in all of these things in many, many ways that you don't even think about. Of course. Of course. The space research. The materials. Right. The military. Yes. Yes. What point would you advise the company to IPO and raise from the stock market? Uh, at the point. Can you just please repeat? Yes. The question is at what point would you advise a company to go public uh, versus go and get more money from, uh, from venture capitalists? So that's a very complicated question, and the, the answer is uh, very simple. It's when you're prepared to have your home address, your income, and all of your business and personal details be published in a prospectus. That's when you should go public. <laughs> because, because they don't get those rights that are No, I, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat teasing. I think that most people who go public, the, the, the people who run the company, are not too happy once they're public because they start to operate the company on a quarter to quarter basis. People people get to know how much they make. They're they're friends in school. It's it's not a it's got some downside. But here's the upside. Typically, uh, it's cheaper. You you get you have to give away less of your company uh, than if you went to a venture capitalist. And once you're public, what you have if the company is successful is currency that's like cash. That stock that's trading on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ is, there's more of it. It's just like the federal government can print more cash, print more dollar bills. You can print more stock and use it to buy other companies. You can print more stock and give it to your employees. You can print more stock and merge. It's, it, it, it gives you the ability to print cash as long as 
you can keep a good story going and you keep your stock price high. And there's one more secret that you've got to keep in mind, which I guess answers what your question a little bit more, less flippantly, which is that the institutional investors like Fidelity, which are the things that, which are the investors that you really want to have because they hold stock for a long time so the stock doesn't become as volatile going up and down in price. They are looking, they are only going to invest, forget the two or three dollars every hundred that we talked about that they put into alternative investments. When it comes to investing in the stock market, they only invest in big companies, companies that have a valuation of many billions of dollars and that have a float, meaning they have a, an amount of stock that is traded in the public markets that's a very high amount. So if you're a little company, you want to go public, but your public valuation is half a billion dollars, $250 million, you're not going to get any attention from the people who, are, who would otherwise keep your stock stable and steady and let it grow. You're going to be uh, selling to a bunch of individual investors who are going to be reading the Yahoo uh, you know, portal that you know, has the craziest stories about companies, and you are going to end up with your company, your stock going up and down like a yo-yo in price, and no, you're no longer going to be able to print money because you'll never know what it's worth, and people are not going to be willing to take it because they won't know what it's worth. So that's kind of the way it goes. But typically, the rule of thumb is, I think you've got to be a half a billion to a billion dollar valuation. You've got to go out and raise 100 to 200 million dollars. And you know, the other thing is, in order to do that, in order to really have stability, you have to have analysts at the big investment banks follow you, write about you, and make sure you're covered in their regular publications. And they only follow the big companies because they don't, they don't have time for the little companies. Yeah? And so you give us uh, some other pictures of pizza and the pizzas who all the time, and I'm sure 99% of the pizzas that's what happens, or maybe not. So what happens in the rare cases, not that rare cases, when the companies start to shrink? Thursday, then. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, good luck. Uh, I mean, look, uh, the question is, from what perspective are you looking at this thing? If you're the investor, you, you, know, you're, you, you know you're investing in a high-risk company, and uh, what can you do? It's, it's, it's life. You're, you're, the reason that I don't like uh, crowdsource, crowdfunding, is because it means that a bunch of uh, un unsophisticated invest uh, people who don't have a lot of money will take money out of their bank that they should be keeping safe for their retirement and they're putting it into these crazy, very <coughs> risky companies. So it's fine for the venture capitalists because they get to see the cream of the crop, they get much better deals than the people who, who have to go to crowdfunding to get their money. I'm convinced of it. But, but as far as the founders are concerned, they go to work for a big company or they, they, they get their next, next gig. And by the way, I think that you know, most people think that it's a great experience to fail because it teaches you to be uh, more successful the next time. But go ahead. Yeah, actually, what I didn't mean. Uh, uh, in Inkabangulu, the Inkabangulu. So, I'm not sure what you're doing. 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 I'm not sure what you're és, és, és valaki vagy, vagy megveszi az egész céget, vagy megveszi a, a, az IP-t, tehát valam, a, a, mondjuk egy tíz, cég, a tíz cégből, amit egy ilyen venture cap, egy ilyen ők és ebbe investál, abból egy vagy kettő sikeres, két-három az, az teljesen tős, a, 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 a megy, csődbe megy, és három-négy, úgy mondják angolul, van ilyen három-négy a közepén, ami az úgynevezett walking dead. <laughs> És azokat el kell adni. Yeah, so a walking dead, yeah, azokat el kell adni. Uh, és, az, az, és, és ott mindig van valami. Először is most a mostani környékben olyan nehéz 
dolgozókat, tehát talentumos dolgozókat találni, hogy ilyen cégeket el lehet adni a dolgozókkal együtt, mert a dolgozók kellenek a, a vásá... A, 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 you know, you, you need the employees for if you're, if you're a company that's going to buy this. You'll buy the technology and you'll buy the people. And you'll give them some equity. It's, 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 it's not great. I mean, the walking dead walk around, you know, like this for a while before everybody realizes that they're dead. You know, for a while everybody thinks they're just, you know, walking in their sleep. But they're actually dead. <laughs> so it takes a while for everybody to realize that they're dead. Once they realize it, it's too late. You re you'd rather sleep, uh, you know, sell somebody when they're walking in their sleep than when they're actually dead. So that's that's the that's the talent. You know, if you're a venture capitalist, people tell you one of the secrets is when to sell. And sometimes it's really better to sell when there's still a promise than to wait until the promise turns into, you know, dud, and then you end up with a walking dead. Yeah. Can you generally, at that time, can you generally sell it to uh, another venture capitalist or is generally uh, another company that... It depends. If you have some great people and some great technology, and then there's another company that is in a very similar, you know, in a, in a, in a complementary market, you could easily, you, it happens, you, you combine the two companies and, and, and the two companies do much, much better because they, they own a bigger size of the market, they have complementary technology. Sometimes that works, sometimes it's just like, you know, putting two dead people in the same bedroom. You know, it doesn't work. There's no spark, no, I, I won't go any farther. I can't for you but you both did Compaq and HP went down together. Perfect. Compaq, that's exactly what Carly Fiorina did. That's what she's going to do to the U.S. if she becomes <laughs> In any event, uh, no, another question. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. You, you had this point about, so you mentioned that crowdfunding and family, friends, and angels. Assume that, you know, we had the back and forth about information. So assume that there's nothing in the documents about information. Do those people have a legal right? Information? No. Okay, it has to be in the documents. I mean, they have a right to find out who the shareholders are. If it's a corporation, Delaware has a whole bunch of things that, if it's a Delaware corporation, as to what shareholders are entitled to. But it's pretty, they don't have to get financial information. They have certain inspection rights. Uh, the, the theory is that if they don't like the, the performance, then they can find the other shareholders and they can have a vote and kick you out. But, you know, I, I think it's, you want to give people uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, certain rights. You want to give them rights for it. Even if you don't give it to them legally, you want to be transparent. You, wanna, you want people to feel that they're part of the effort. So I always uh, advise people to, to provide information. And, uh, and, 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 and by the way, if you don't provide information, they'll just call you at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Uh, they will, I know it. And, uh, and, and that's not good, you know. Uh, so I think it's better to, be, to, to, to manage expectations by telling them what you're going to give them and then, then give it to them. Any other question? Yeah? Are there uh, reservations on the Job Act? It seems like it's mostly on the investor side. People are just not buying any pro money in, but um, I, mean, I think it's a good companies that are receiving the money, but I think it's see eventually there's going to be intermediaries that are going to basically match and take that money and match it to... The, 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 the job act contemplates intermediaries. It's not, I mean, it's a good opportunity to start right there. Yes, I think that somebody who, I mean, there are a couple of companies that have arisen that are intermediaries that are, uh, are supposed, uh, that are, whose job it is to match investors to companies. The problem is I know somebody who was in that industry and, and left it. The regulations are, 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 are still pretty bad, pretty, pretty stringent. The amount of information that if, if it's for, for larger investments is, is, is a lot. It's almost like taking a company public. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's to be seen. I do think, I do think that you know, somebody will figure out how to do this the way they figured out how to do it's other things. It, well, you, you, the, the problem is that uh, you, you don't get enough money to make it worthwhile on this. I, I think the opportunity is for a company to start to be an intermediary. Uh, and, 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 and as long as they take out a huge amount of uh, liability insurance because uh, they're going to get sued for 
defrauding the investors because <coughs> it's still, you know, you're talking about a very, very risky investment. The reason that so far these very risky investments were all made by venture capitalists is because they are sophisticated. They are assumed to know how to take risks, and they're taking money that is this 2% out of $100 that is dedicated for very risky investments. Anything? Was this helpful? Yes. Did you learn something you didn't know before? Tényleg egy csomó új dolgot tanultunk, az biztos. Ha véletlenül valamit nem értettetek meg, van egy jó híre, az egészet felvettük videóra. Oh, okay. És a Pisti lesz olyan jó, és olyan segítőkész, hogy ezt fel fogja tölteni a Youtube-ra. Én nem mondom azt, hogy ez a jövő héten meg fog történni, de hamarosan, úgyhogy elérhető lesz mindenki számára. Úgyhogy nagyon szépen köszönöm, hogy eljöttetek. Még annyit hagyd tegyek hozzá, hogy a következő Tudós Klub december 11-én lesz, az előadónk a Nagy Nándor, aki az MGH-ben, a Harvardon és a Sotén dolgozik. Ő a ősejtekről fog nekünk beszélni, és ez egy közös rendezvény lesz a Magyar-Amerikai Orvos Szövetséggel közösen. Úgyhogy mindenkit szeretettel várunk, addig is mindenkinek boldog hálaadást, és természetesen arra bátorítanál benneteket, hogy maradjatok, van még egy csomó inni ennivaló, beszélgessünk, nem muszáj elmenni, szóval élvezik, hogy így együtt vagyunk. Köszönöm, hogy eljöttetek, köszönöm szépen. Ez az is.